In the previous part of this lecture, we talked about the phospholipid bilayer and how that's sort of the basic component of the cell membrane that makes the wall. But we also mentioned how while it prevents most things from crossing, allowing some things to cross, it can't do the other jobs on its own. It can't regulate what can go in and out, and it can't bring information in or display information. Most of that is going to be the job of the other, one of the other major components of the membrane called membrane proteins. So if I were to sketch up here, let's just draw in, this will be our phospholipid bilayer. So we've got water out here. This is outside. And water in here. This is inside. This is that lipophilic core. You can imagine these two black lines, the hydrophilic heads of the phospholipids. Proteins can also be a part of this membrane. So let's just sketch in how that might work. So Remember, the inside here is lipophilic, and then out here we've got water, which means hydrophilic. Remember, proteins in their various levels of structure can have areas which are made of hydrophilic amino acids and areas made of lipophilic. Let's draw that in. We'll say red is hydrophilic and blue will be lipophilic. So let's imagine what the structure of a protein would have to be in order for it to be part of this membrane. We could imagine a protein that sits in a membrane like this, where part of it is exposed to the outside and part of it is just embedded in the membrane. In order for that to work, you'd probably have to have the amino acids in this part of the protein largely be hydrophilic and the ones in this part largely be lipophilic, because they're the ones that are going to be exposed to the inside part of the membrane here. Remember, this part on the inside is lipophilic. That's the fatty acid tails. So for a protein to sit halfway in the membrane, it's going to probably have to be largely structured like that. And the nice thing about this is, if you tried to pull this out of the membrane, you'd be exposing these lipophilic amino acids to the water out here you try to pull it out and let it go, and it's probably going to kind of snap back into place as these things move back into where they're around the other lipophilic things. Likewise, if you try to push it into the membrane, these hydrophilic amino acids won't be very happy in that lipophilic core, and it'll tend to stabilize. This stays stuck here very nicely. So this is a membrane protein that only sticks out on one side of the membrane. You could do the same thing on the inside easily enough. But some membrane proteins go all the way through. You can imagine that one like that has to have a structure where the outside and inside are going to be largely made of hydrophilic amino acids, and the inside will be largely lipophilics. Also, will be fairly stable in there. Now, that might be a little hard to envision, because we know that, uh, amino that a protein is made of a at least one long chain of amino acids. So let's think of another way we might envision that. If I draw a line that's the chain, I could say this part of the chain is made of hydrophilics, and then we've got a lipophilic part of the chain, then a hydrophilic part, lipophilic, hydrophilic, lip you get the idea. You could make a chain of amino acids that would be likely to fold itself up into a membrane protein just by making it have the right sections be lipophilic and the right sections be hydrophilic. That chain could easily fold up into a way that would work well as a membrane protein. And these get, you, you get some interesting things with this. You could have a membrane protein that has some big complicated structure out here, or you could even have one that makes itself into a ring so that there's a hole down the middle so some things could go through the membrane that way. Almost any structure you can imagine, you could do with protein. So these proteins make up a big part of a membrane, some substantial percentage. Depends on the cell, but well over 10% of the weight of a membrane will be proteins stuck in it. And we should all, it would probably be a good idea to talk about what kind of things those proteins do. What jobs do these proteins have? So let's talk about how, how these might work. 
Now, one important thing is to think about what are these attached to? Are they actually just sitting here or do they do something else? Often, these membrane proteins will have chains of carbohydrates, like chains of glucose or other monosaccharides, stuck to them out here, almost like little signal tags. So these are carbohydrates. stuck on the outside of the protein. You could almost imagine something like that, or those could be on this one too, as the posters on the castle wall. These chains are often signals to other things that when they encounter those, they can recognize it and it carries information about what this cell is or what it's doing. These proteins with carbohydrates on them are called glycoproteins very common thing that you find in cell, in cell membranes. Another thing that's often attached to these is structures on the inside of the cell. So we can have filaments and tubules that are part of what we call the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton is a network of tubes and fibers that form a structure inside the cell, that give the cell its shape and also provide physical things that you can use to transport things along the cell. There are, my favorite protein is actually a protein which almost walks along the cytoskeleton, like that, carrying things from place to place. So this cytoskeleton provides shape, transport, and sometimes even cellular movement. If a cell is going to move itself, one way it can do that is to build cytoskeleton in one area, which pushes the cell membrane out, and dissolve it in another area, which pulls the cell membrane in. But that's a topic for another day. So, two things that you often find attached to these membrane proteins, worth knowing. Now, let's talk about some of the jobs these membrane proteins can do. All right, first, a protein could be doing a job as a structural protein. These are proteins which are usually attached to the cytoskeleton. And they tend to do the job of either sticking to something outside the cell, so they provide adhesion. Maybe they stick to another cell, or they stick to some sort of molecular matrix outside the cell, but they provide a way for the cell to stay in place. Structural proteins can also play an important role in changing the shape of the cell. By providing an attachment point for the cytoskeleton, they can be a place where we build cytoskeleton to push things out or dissolve it to bring things in. So these help provide shape, shape change, and adhesion for cells. So that's one job. Another one is they can be membrane enzymes. So you might have the cartoon I usually draw for this. Looks like this. So imagine that this is the cell membrane. This is the membrane protein. This is meant to be the active site of that enzyme, the place where the substrate binds and the reaction occurs. A membrane enzyme is an en a protein which is acting as an enzyme that's embedded in a membrane. That can do a couple things. It can just provide a place where you say, this reaction gets catalyzed here, only at this location. This protein is not free to wander around in the cell. Some enzymes are, but sometimes we want that to be at a particular place. 
Another way that this can work is you might want to have an enzyme facing, let's say, the outside of the cell so that I can say when some molecule outside the cell comes by, a membrane enzyme can cause a reaction and change it in some way. And I want that to happen on the outside of my cell. Or it might be turned around so it does something on the inside of that membrane. Or you can get some pretty interesting things with that if you combine it with one of the other jobs, which we'll get to in a little bit. But the basic idea of a membrane enzyme is that it's an enzyme that stays at a particular place and it might be used to face outward or inward in the cell or just to hold it at a particular spot in the cell. Now, when we talked about enzyme regulation, we talked about how many enzymes have regulatory sites that some other molecule can bind and cause that enzyme to work better or worse. So let's imagine that we have a membrane enzyme here like this, where it's, let's say this is inside the cell this time. This is outside. Let's imagine that it has a regulatory site here on the outside. So what this means is that a regulatory molecule outside the cell can cause this enzyme to catalyze or not catalyze its reaction inside the cell. Think about what that means. That means that the presence of some molecule outside the cell changes what's going on inside the cell. That starts to sound a little bit like our guard on our wall going, I see barbarians. The presence of barbarians causes a change inside the cell. Keep that in mind as we go into some of our next jobs here. That's just one possibility. Not all membrane enzymes are like that but it's an important kind of thing. Now, a third job is the idea of a membrane receptor. And a receptor causes a change inside the cell in response to something outside the cell. Think about what we just did. This is an example of how a protein could be doing the job of a receptor. Something outside the cell causes a change inside the cell. So that protein is actually doing both jobs. It is both an enzyme and a receptor. But that's not the only way a receptor can work. In whatever way it happens, if the protein allows something outside the cell to cause something to happen inside the cell, then it's working as a receptor. This is a way of bringing information about the world into the cell. Actually, structural proteins can be, can be receptors too. You could imagine that if what I had was a membrane protein attached to the cytoskeleton and it had a regulatory side on the outside so that when something outside the cell bound to it, it caused the cytoskeleton to change in a way that made the cell change shape, then it's acting as a receptor and a structural protein. So these jobs are not mutually exclusive. A single protein can do more than one, and in fact often does. There are some other ways receptors can work, and the next category is, actually gets into that too. Some, of them, some receptors are enzymes, some are other types. So let's talk about the last of the jobs. Here's the first three. Job number four is a membrane transporter. So, so far we've talked about how our castle wall can stop the movement of things in and out of the cell. That's the job of the phospholipid bilayer. Bring information in. That's the job of a receptor. Display information, that's the job of any glycoprotein, any membrane protein can have those, as long as it's on the outside of the cell, you can attach things to it that act as signals. What we haven't done yet is talked about the gates. How do we control the movement of things into and out of the cell? That's going to be the job of transporters. Membrane transporters are proteins which move other molecules across the membrane or in some cases just allow them to move. Sometimes it's more passive. 
Other times it's more active. That Those terms actually have specific meaning and we'll get to those. Now, there's several ways this can work. So if you're taking notes on this, kind of set a whole area aside for membrane transport because I will tell you something right now. When you're studying physiology, understanding how, how and when things move across cell membranes is a big fraction of the whole concept. One thing you'll see again and again as we go through physiology is when are things moving into cells or out of cells and when is information moving? So receptors and transporters, that's a large fraction of how physiology works. So set aside in there because we're going to talk in a little bit of detail about this one. So membrane transporters. First, we could talk about one way of talking about these, which is are they channels or carriers? So these are two different kinds of transport proteins, channels and carriers. Let's talk about channels first. So this cartoon I will usually use for a channel looks like this. And if you want, you can imagine, if we imagine it in sort of three dimensional, this is a cutaway view. It's actually more of a little tunnel that goes through the membrane. It's a protein arranged that has a hole in the middle so the materials can just flow through, inward or outward. I usually just draw them like this. You can just imagine the rest of it. So channels transport ions or water. They really only work for small things. And you can almost imagine why. If I had a, a channel big enough to let glucose through, then anything smaller than glucose could also go through. So these really only work well for very small things because they need to be selective. And they can be. So these can be selective for what they transport. You can have channels that transport only calcium ions or only chloride ions or only water molecules. You have some others that can transport sodium or potassium ions, but not chloride ions. So they can be selective. They can also be gated. They don't have to be. Some channels are simple and they're pretty much always just open. They're just a hole in the membrane that allows whatever it is they're selective for to pass through. There's another subtlety where some channels only easily allow movement of something one direction, but that's those are kind of weird, called rectifier channels, and we're not going to get into those right now. But they can be, and this is very important, gated, meaning that they can they can be made to open or close under some circumstances. It actually I'm going to go ahead and kind of erase this so we can talk a little bit about gating of channels. So in your notes, leave this and leave the part about carriers because so, we're going to come back to that, but just keep going on the whole channels thing. Let's talk about how channels can be gated. So what kinds of things could make a channel open or close? We can kind of come up with three. Mechanically gated. A mechanically gated channel opens in response to physical force. So when something actually pushes on the channel, or maybe just the membrane around it, it causes the channel to open or close. So this responds to force. A common version of this would be stretch-sensitive channels that open or close based on whether the membrane around them gets stretched one way or the other, or stretched or pushed. There's an easy example of these to know about. Think about this. When I reach out and touch this, I know that I have touched that board. How do I know that? When I say I know it, it means that something goes on in my brain that receives the information that I'm touching the board. But how? What kind of information is that? What's actually happening is that when I touch the board, 
there are cells who have extensions in my fingertip that have stretch sensitive ion channels. When I touch the board, those stretch sensitive ion channels get activated as the cell membrane there gets pushed. They open, ions flow into or out of the cell, which causes a change in the cell, which causes an effect, we're going to talk about this in the nervous system, that travels up nerves in my arm to my brain and causes changes in my brain that cause me to perceive touch. So my ability to say, yes, I'm touching that is fundamentally based on the stretch sensitive ion channels in cells in my fingertips. Actually, another sense depends on these, that's hearing. Although it's not exactly stretch sensitive, there's a different kind of mechanical gating going on in there, but it's still responding to physical force, in this case, vibrations. But set that aside for now. We're gonna to get to that, it's awfully cool stuff. So that's one way channels can be gated. Another way, is chemically gated. They respond to the binding of a ligand. The term ligand just refers to any molecule which binds to something else. So these chemically gated channels will respond when some other particular molecule or ion or atom binds to a particular spot on them, and that causes the protein to change shape in such a way that they open or sometimes close. So you can imagine if this is my channel, if we imagine it's normally closed, when the right other thing binds to it, pop, it opens up and things can move through it. Take that away and it might close up. Again, subtleties, there are variations on this, but that's the basic idea. You can see easily how that can be a receptor. You could have, if you've got a cell membrane and I've got a channel here and something outside the cell, the right thing binds to it and it opens, that's going to let ions flow into or out of that cell, which can cause a change inside the cell. So that, in that case, we are both a transporter and a receptor, which is kind of cool. Uh, one example of this you're going to see a lot in the nervous system is something called the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So that's a channel which is normally gated, closed, that's how I usually draw a gate, like a little swinging thing, although it's not a swinging thing, that responds to the chemical acetylcholine. Don't, and don't worry, we're going to get into this in more detail later. This is just to sort of prepare you for it. When acetylcholine binds to that channel in the right spot, the gate opens and ions can flow across. So it's a receptor for acetylcholine that causes a change inside the cell. Kind of cool. A third way that these can be gated is voltage gated. There can be channels which respond to electrical changes around the cell membrane. When there's something that causes a, a difference in charge between the inside and the outside of the cell, then it can cause some channels to open or close. So these respond to electrical changes. Now that gets interesting because of course if I have a channel that lets ions, charged things, flow across the membrane, then a change in electrical characteristics causes this channel to open, which lets ions cross the membrane, which causes a change in the electrical characteristics, which might cause other ion channels to open or close, which causes a change in electrical characteristics. So we get this interesting feedback idea going here. And it is interesting and complicated. And it's the basis for nerve signals, which we will get to. So those are three ways that channels can be gated, mechanically, chemically, and by voltage. You'll see examples of all of these as we go. All right, so that's channels. Now, let's take a moment to talk about carriers. So in your notes, you go back up to that part where we had carriers over there. The cartoon I use for carriers usually looks like either this or this, depending on whether it's a passive or an active carrier, and we'll get to that. 
carriers, unlike channels, channels where you actually open a hole that small things can move through, like water or ions, carriers can allow larger things to pass because they don't actually open a hole. Instead, they're more like a machine that changes shape. So you could imagine that this, if here's my membrane, this could be a pen carrier. So if pen outside the cell binds to it, it changes shape in such a way as to move that pen through the membrane without ever actually opening a hole for other things to move through. Or it could even go the other way. You bind there and it kind of goes and sticks, brings the pen through. So these change shape rather than opening a hole. And we can divide these up based on how many things they carry and in what direction. So we can talk about, is a, chan a carrier a uniport or a co-transport? Uniports carry one thing across the membrane. An example of that is something called the GLUT, which is a glucose transporter. The GLUT is a carrier which allows glucose to pass into or out of the cell. It carries glucose through the membrane in either direction, but only glucose, which is why we call it a uniport. It just carries one thing. Co-transports carry more than one thing. Undoubtedly a great shock to you. Now, of course, because scientists love to break things up into smaller classifications, we can divide co-transports into two categories. Symport and antiport. So here, if we're kind of doing this uniports here, co-transports here, and now we're going to divide that into two other kinds. So these are both co-transports. Symports carry the things that are moving across the membrane in the same direction. So things move in the same direction. An example of that would be something called the SGLT. Uh, that stands for, and you do not need to know this right now, sodium glucose luminal transport. You're going to see this several times in the class uh, in both the urinary and the digestive system. The SGLT is a transport which allows sodium ions and glucose molecules to pass through the membrane, but they have to be going in the same direction. So it will allow them both to go through this way or that way, but they do have to be going in the same direction. It will not let sodium go this way while a glucose goes that way. Not because it's a symport, that's not how it works. Compare that to antiports, and you can probably guess what this is, where the things move in opposite directions. An example here is a transporter which moves HCO3 minus, which is the bicarbonate ion, across the membrane in one direction in exchange for chloride ions moving in the other direction. So it'll work this way or this way, but they have to be going in opposite directions to work. So three examples of carriers. Now, one thing about what I've drawn here is these are all what we call passive carriers, meaning they don't require the cell to use energy to get them to work. And as far as I know, all passive carriers also allow movement in both directions. So like the glucose transporter, glucose can move either way. SGLT, so these two things can move inward or outward. In this, they, have to, they can both move in either direction as long as they're going opposite directions. There are examples of active carriers as well. But we haven't really talked about the difference between passive and active. That's going to come in the last part of this lecture. So we'll get to that in just a bit. And I believe that that is all I wanted to tell you about these types of membranes. So we talked about 
four roles for membrane transporters, structural, enzyme, receptor, and transporter. And then we went into detail on the various kinds of transporters because that's a huge part of physiology. In the last part of this lecture, we're going to talk about some of the details on one way that things cross, which is the idea of passive transport, where no energy is being used to force things to move across a membrane in one direction or another. And to talk about that, we're going to be talking about the two main forms of that, which are diffusion. And so we're talking about membranes, we'll talk about facilitated diffusion and osmosis. So let's get to go, let's get going on that in the next part.